Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that won't cause you to have ulcers in your stomach because you're all stressed out, wondering how you're going to pay the college bills. I am Mark Stucker. And I am Anika Madden. It is Thursday, September 15th. And welcome to episode number 33, How Selective Colleges Evaluate Class Rankings. In this week's news, we're discussing an article on middle class families and how they are increasingly looking toward community colleges to cut costs. And we are in chapter 33 of 171 Answers, and we're talking about how colleges evaluate class rankings. And this week's question is from a student who wants to know which of his teachers he should ask to write his recommendations. And Mark welcomes back Ms. Deb Shaver for his interview this week, and she is now the Dean of Admissions Emerita of Smith College. And Deb was a Dean for 23 years until last month, and she reflects on her Smith College experience and what makes Smith College unique. Anika, I'm going to put you on the quiz train here and ask you a quick question. <laughs> yeah, well, I should actually call it the guessing game. The guessing game, okay. right? So, so, so this is crazy. I've had the same question six times this week. Whoa. Um, and, and I just got it actually one hour ago by text for the sixth time in the last seven days about the college admission process. I'm going to give you one guess to see if you can get it right. What do you, what do you think I keep getting asked this week? How do I get in? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I, I, mean, think I, know it's on, I think I know it's on your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I get the money? I mean. <laughs> That's another you know. good one. <laughs> so, Go ahead and give so, it to us. <laughs> so the question I keep getting this week, those are other weeks. The question this week is, why am I getting all of this mail? Uh, and what, and okay. what does it mean? Does it mean that I'm, my child's getting in because I'm getting mm-hmm. all this mail from all these really prestigious, highly selective schools? And mm-hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I want to say for our listeners, we did a, a, I thought was a really good uh, segment on that on episode 25. In fact, the name of that episode is called Why Am I Getting All This Mail? And if you don't want to listen to the whole episode, but you just want to listen to that segment, you can go to yourcosmoundkid.com and go right to the 15 minute mark. And it's like a 10 minute discussion. Uh, anything else you want to add, Anika? Which episode number was that, Mark, that we did that? Uh, 25. 25. 25. Okay. Episode yeah. 25. Yeah. 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 Listen, listen in. That's, that's, and all these questions I'm getting, I'm doing the same thing, Mark. Go to episode number such and such. Because <laughs> I promise you, we've covered it at some point. If not, we're getting there. We will be. <laughs> we will, we will be. But, you know, thank you guys. For, once again, I will say this our listeners, we had some really good questions you guys sent in this week. Mm-hmm. So we love your questions. Remember, if you have a question about the college admission process, send it where, Anika? What's our, what's our email? Questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Bring them on. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. Okay, Mark, our article for the week was so fascinating. Um, It's entitled Middle Class Families Increasingly Look to Community Colleges. And this is coming from Mr. Kyle Spencer. Um, It's in the New York Times uh, recently this year. And so, Mark, traditionally, community colleges have catered to low income first gen Uh students. But we've got these middle class families that are really stepping it up. And they're saying they are not subscribing to the idea that the only acceptable education is an expensive Uh one. So that's I don't want to dive too deep into this, Mark, because I do have several questions for you. But I just thought that I mean, it's just Uh a growing trend. And so these these students are saying, you know, because, you know, students, we know the expectation, especially high achieving students, top students. They are expected to go to colleges, Uh four year institutions that are either prestigious, they're pricey or Uh they're far away. You know, that's that's just kind of the thing to do. Right. That's 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 what the expectation generally is. But what this article does, Mark, is it it cites specifically these increases in enrollment at these community colleges. And just as a couple of examples, Pasadena Uh City College, um, they saw a 320 percent increase in students whose parents make more than one hundred thousand dollars a year. Mark, that was crazy. You've got Williston State College in North Dakota, Colorado Northwestern Uh Community Uh College in Wrangley. And Northern Virginia Community College, they are all talking about this, these, you know, like these alarming yep. increase in numbers. And, and, what, and, and to take it to the next level, these academic experts are saying that we're expecting uh-huh. this to grow. 
especially, you know, I think Obama started talking about this, or at least that's where I started hearing or listening and paying attention to it. As more cities and states and institutions, they start to offer these free programs. And he cites someone specifically by Governor Jerry Brown in California. Um, he just recently signed that initiative into mm-hmm. law in October. So with all that said, Mark, what do you just tell us your general thoughts around this? And I just want to tell you a couple of other fascinating th- things I thought about this, but I want to hear you. Talk uh, well, first. It, first of all, that was a really good intro, the way you teed it up. You really that was good. That was really good. Oh, I mean, thank that. That you. Good. So um, it's a really interesting trend, uh, Anika, because, you know, I'll just be transparent. If the way raised the way I was, community college was not going to be an option. Like my parents didn't do that. Right. And so that wasn't an option. And um, I was probably in the raising a pretty squarely middle class family with both my parents being educators, my dad being an administrator, my mom being a teacher. Mm-hmm. That was not an option, not anything I ever thought of. And then when I worked at Westtown School, of course, I'm at a private, highly selective Quaker boarding school. People aren't paying 50 grand to send their kid to community college. They're just not. So that wasn't seen as an option there. Mm-hmm. And then even now, you know, I'm at KIPP in the day and I do private coaching in the evening and weekends. Um, KIPP is founded by Yale and a Penn alums, high achieving, highly uh, high achieving, very ambitious people. Uh, they haven't been that favorable haven't looked at community colleges that favorably and and um and then mm. certainly people that hire me privately they're not hiring me to go to community college they're just not so there's been this mindset that community college is really only for low income or kids who really struggled right because you can go to community college right. with any test mm-hmm. scores usually with a ged or a diploma Right. You can go to community colleges mm-hmm. with a two point one if you get out. You don't have to have certain GPAs. So they're non selective. They're what we call open admission schools. Uh in meaning, you know, you don't have to have this certain criteria with grades and test scores and recommendations and everything to get in. So they do in general overall have a higher percentage of lower achieving. And overall they do have lower graduation rates, which has tended to stigmatize them. Mm-hmm. But a couple of right. things have happened. One is the financial crisis all the way back to two thousand eight and before that. And going even back before that, but states are giving less and less and less money to fund the public colleges in their state, passing the burden on to families, making even your local public schools not necessarily affordable. Uh, We've talked about the escalating Mm. cost of college and how astronomically college has gone up at a rate higher than healthcare by far. Um, So Mm -hmm. that's making people say, I don't necessarily know if we can afford college. Uh, On top of that, the community colleges have made a lot of improvements. And in fact, you may remember some of those from right. the article, Anika. Um, for example, mm-hmm. this is going to blow some people away, but more and more community colleges are now offering their own four-year degree plans and not just a two-year degree. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. And then yep. also some of the facilities that some of them are trying to offer as well. You know, so um, here's mm-hmm. an actual quote from that article that we're, we're using as our feature article. Today, by the way, this came out in April 5th, 2018 by Kyle Spencer, New York Times. So here's the kind of thing that community colleges are doing to step up their game. And and this is actually uh, from the Pasadena College that you alluded to earlier, which is one of the ones featured in in the article. It says, to lure lure students, some two-year colleges are starting to look at their four-year peers offering study abroad programs, modern dorms renovated cafeterias says we don't have lazy rivers and climbing walls says scott ross president of northern virginia community college which consists of six campuses outside of washington that have become magnets for the area's middle class students but the college does have an honors program a hockey team a new eighty thousand square foot fine arts center campus bookstore fitness center multi-purpose gym and then it says as for pasadena the outdoor sw- Olympic size swimming pool is hard to miss because they have it along mm-hmm. with sign up sheets for tennis, fencing and coding clubs and nearby students can grab coffee at the campus campuses espresso bar. Mm-hmm. So these were things that hadn't hadn't been offered before. And, and, and also even having any residential space at all, because most of the time community colleges are commuter schools. Right. So having even dorm capacity. Right. And then one other thing, and this is major is that a lot of highly selective colleges are starting to look at transfer applicants 
from community colleges is a gold mine that has been untapped. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. article talks about how Princeton is being very vocal and public about the fact that they are going to start taking more transfer students and they're going to tap into community colleges to find them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the article talks about people attending some very prestigious four-year schools coming from two-year colleges. So that's my thoughts in a nutshell. You said you had a question or two? Well, that was, well, first of all, let me just say those are the two fascinating points. Because <laughs> I was like, ooh, wait, they have dorms now? They have study abroad programs? Like, that just blew me away. But and most thing, don't. Most don't. Remember, yeah, most, most don't, don't but some do. So yeah. It. So that's, that's what I wanted to tap into because, mm-hmm. you know, we, we talk, you talked about uh, Princeton being one of the ones that are lining up to, to really focus on these transfer students. So my question is, I wonder if this mentality is because, you know, we talk about sticker shock before, right? Or, or right. the st- sticker price. Yeah. Is it that these families don't really know how to tap into the money at these institutions? Is the reason why they're thinking, OK, let me just go this route? Or mm-hmm. is it that they just uh, well, let's just stop there, because I wonder yeah. if that's just yeah. it. Is it that they just don't yeah. understand how to really because what you say, the institutional money is mm-hmm. the biggest piece of the pie. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. is it just is that a void? Is that a, a void in education on the part of these families? Mm-hmm. Or what do you think? Uh, that's a great question. So the question is. Why is it that families are saying I can't afford a four year school? Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. And it is lots of reasons for that. Um, in some cases, they don't know how to tap into scholarship money, both institutional merit money and even outside uh, scholarship money. They don't know how to tap into that. In some cases, they apply to the wrong schools. Mm-hmm. So their child's not eligible to receive money. They may have tried to apply to the four year schools and haven't gotten it. Um, and in other instances, you know, I'm just going to be real transparent. It, it's a lot easier to get merit money, institutional merit money, as well as outside money. If your child is, a, you know, is an above average child or has some area where they stand out. Mm-hmm. So if, if, you know, if your child is, has middling grades, you know, average scores, hasn't really done that much to impact their school community doesn't have a real strong, say, volunteer track record outside of school. They're not the best scholarship candidate. They're they're just not. Now, I'm not saying they're not scholarships that are out there for them, Mm -hmm. but they're going to have a harder time winning them. And most of the time when you see kids who say, I won $250,000 or $500,000 for scholarship money outside, when you take a look at it, those kids usually have something that is pretty stupendous. uh, about them. So it could be any of the above reasons. Right. um, But Usually the biggest reason is they don't understand the process and they apply to the wrong schools. Right. That's normally the reason because a lot of times, even a kid who's fairly median, middling, uh, may appear average or in the middle of the pack, there's still money for them if they know how to apply to the right schools and go through the right process. Right. And speaking of applying to the right schools, that still applies to this community college process, because one thing that this article talks about is kids that are finding out a little bit too late is that they intended to save money by going the community college route, but they're learning that they have to retake a lot of courses uh, when they transfer to certain four year schools. So they didn't take the time to understand what that transfer process looked like at certain institutions. So I wanted to bring that out, too, because, again, this article cites what, two, three, four schools, ooh, community colleges um, out of a land of many. So I just want to make sure that that, you know, because honestly, Mark, I was like, oh, my goodness, is this a route <laughs> when I first well, looked at it? But there, Well, I mean, there are more than two to four. This is just what was highlighted. These two to four right, right. are but, attracting but I mean in terms middle of, class kids. Right, right. But what I mean so. in terms of actually having that relationship with these higher education institutions that, you know, have a real or a, a, a solid track of transferring that kid from one institution to the other, you know, saying that these so, are so, actually going to transfer over. So I would say there are a lot more. There are actually a lot of schools that can be respected if you go there and do well. And a lot of schools have, you know, good articulation agreements. And we're having a special guest coming up um, either November or December that's going to talk about community colleges in depth. And we'll get into articulation agreements and transferring and what transfers and what doesn't transfer and how that process works. We'll get into that. If you keep listening to episodes, you'll you'll get that. But but the one thing I want to say, uh, Anika, is. The low graduation rates freaks people out of community colleges. Mm -hmm. And you have to you have to know your you have to know your child. Right. Because it is true that a lot of community colleges, the students that are there, um, they're not necessarily your higher achievers in high school. There are Mm -hmm. a lot of non-traditional students or a lot of older students or mostly commuting students. There are a lot of students that have full time jobs. There are a lot of students that have 
babies and multiple multiple kids. And if your child is the kind of person that is going to be, um, you know, going to be influenced by the fact that a lot of students around them, they may be on the eight to 10 year plan or, mm. <laughs> you know, and, mm-hmm. and there's, there's a different phase in life, um, then it may not be the best environment for you. But if you're the kind of student that can say, listen, I'm going to keep my eye on the prize. I'm going to stay focused, hunker down. I'm going to make sure my credits transfer. And if finances really, truly are a major issue for your family, then it is something that I think more families need to take a look at. But hmm. all right, there it is. Now it's time for our step by step walk through of the college admissions process. Are you not waiting on me? Oh, I always am. (laughs) It's it's episode 33 and I haven't figured out. I figured that, but I was like, I'm going to give him a chance. It's it's episode 33 and I haven't figured out the chapter time I'm supposed to lead with. Like, maybe give give me till 50 and maybe I'll figure that out. Oh, Oh, my goodness. Take your time. Okay, it's all good. It is all good. All right. so, So this is the part of our podcast that we refer to as our course. It's our walk step by step, walk through the college admission process. And and the reason why we do it that way is we don't want you guys to have any gaps in your background. So we take random questions from our listeners and we take articles that are hot or we think will be interesting, but um, there could be a big swath of knowledge in some area that you don't have. So this is systematic. And we use as our textbook, a book that I wrote called 171 Answers, subtitled to the most asked college admissions questions. And there's 171 chapters. So what we do is we just take a point or two out of each chapter and have a discussion. So um, our chapter this week is looking at, at rankings. Uh, these would be high school rankings. So your kid is ranked 212th out of 407, or they're ranked 17th out of 380. And, and we're looking at how do colleges view rankings? Uh, what happens if there is no ranking? And just discussions along that area. Nico, what, do you, what, are, what were your takeaways from the chapter? Well, I know that I've I've never really understood rankings, so I appreciated your clear definition in the beginning of the chapter uh, to say, okay, if I'm number 282 on the list, that means there are 281 kids whose GPA is higher than mine. And honestly, Mark, I didn't totally get that. You know, I I hadn't really wrapped my mind around that. And more so because Jalen was at one of those schools or was at a school that did not subscribe to ranking. And I know we've we've talked about this before where these, you know, private institutions and kind of um, upper class areas are going away from that for a variety of reasons. Uh-huh. Um, so, but it was just helpful to know when they're used, how they're used. And it's just interesting that so many people are pulling away from it, but at the same time, colleges are still putting weight on it if it appears on the transcript. Uh-huh. Um, so it just depends on where you are, right? You know, does your, does your school do it or not? Yes. Um, so I don't know. Are you for, I, I know you took, Mark, just remind us, are you for or against Rankings. Okay, so that so that's going to be a deep and complex question, but I want to answer it. Okay, <laughs> so first thing that I will say is, if I'm working with a student, um, and this could be either as private college coaching or at Kip, because our listeners may not know, I, I do college counseling at Kip, but I'm not just working with students from one school. I'm working with students that graduated from one middle school, and they're spread out amongst like thirty or forty different schools. So if I'm working with a student, whether at KIPP or, or in private college coaching, and of course, I want to want to get their transcript right away, right? Because the transcript is the most important part of the process. And so if I'm going to help them build their list and assess their options, I have to have the transcript. It literally is the most important thing. So when I get a transcript, I will say this. I love, 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 love rankings. Love them. They're the, mm. abs- they're the first thing I look at. And the reason for that is I can get a two second immediate glance and put the student in context with how they've done in their high school. Synonymous with me saying, I only look at a ranking. I study the transcript and the school profile like a detective with a magnifying class, looking for things like course rigor, grade trends, grade distributions, course descriptions, to name a few. As as Hmm. you said, rankings are based on grade point average, right? And the students are just lined up from the highest grade point average that's why the valedictorian is ranked number one. They have the highest grade point average all the way to the, to the last. So when I'm on the placement side, I love them. Um, and, and, and the reason for that is, let's say a school does not have rankings. And so I'm looking at a transcript right now, right? And I see three A's and two B's. Let's just say that's 
typically what they get. Well, I was just focused on the academic classes, math, science, English, history, foreign language. But even let's just say it's half A's, half B's for the whole transcript. Mm-hmm. OK, the, the, the challenge I have with that without rankings is I don't really know how you compare to your peers because I don't know how much grade inflation exists at your school. So I don't know mm-hmm. if half A's and half B's means you're in the top. 20% of your class or if you're in the bottom 25% of your class, because I don't know how much grade inflation is mm-hmm. there. Okay. And mm. now some schools have, and then we've talked about school profiles before, they, they provide on their school profile what's called a grade distribution. And when I have a grade distribution, now it's extremely helpful because what a grade distribution will do is it will let me know, well, there, there are different ways they're set up, but one common example of a grade distribution will, it'll have It'll divide the students into quartiles, which is groups of four, or quintiles, groups of five, or deciles, which is groups of 10. And it will show me like a GPA. Goodness. It'll show me a GPA. I know this stuff is complicated, isn't it, Nika? <laughs> <laughs> and it'll, <Yeah. laughs> but, but it'll show me like GPA cutoffs for the, if it's quartiles, it'll be the top quarter, the second quarter, the third, or the fourth. Or quintiles, it'll be same thing. First, fifth, second, fifth, third, fifth, fourth, fifth, and deciles, same thing. So that's really helpful. Because now I can look at your grades and I can kind of see where you are in relationship to your class. So on a placement side, it is immense, immensely helpful for me. When I was in college uh, admissions or boarding school admissions, I did both. Extremely helpful because I could look at it and see where you were in relation to your class. Um, having said all of that, I know this is going to sound crazy. <laughs> I would not have rankings on a transcript if I was in charge at a high-performing suburban school or a high-powered independent school where I was around a lot of high, higher achievers. And when I was at Westtown School mm. for nine years, we had no rankings, and that was smart. So I have to ask you the question, Anika, why would I be... Well, you know why I'm bullish on rankings as a private college coach um, or even in my mm. work at KIPP, but why would I be opposed to having them, in your opinion? What do you think? Well, more so because I read your chapter. <laughs> <laughs> you it's did because- your homework. Homework. <laughs> number one well and 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 it helped because i got it because i remember when i learned about Jalen's school and i was like why are you not doing it? i thought it was like a good thing but anyway mm-hmm. so one reason why schools get away from it is because they kind of pit it's a it's a it's a culture it, you kind of pit the kids the kids against each other you know i'm mm-hmm. number one you're number two number number three mm-hmm. and then also as you're applying to these institutions where a kid is a number 15 at that school they could easily be a number three or a number two or number one at another school. Yes. So how much how much time does that institution take to digest and calculate that? Probably not much at all. Mm-hmm. So that's why they are not good and the, on the on the admission side of the world. Yeah. Um, so 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 just, so just to to reinforce what Anika said. So let's say you're in a high performing suburban school district or a private school. Um, you know if if you did have rankings and your child, let's say, was, let's say, in the middle of the pack in the rankings, let's say, let's, let's keep it simple. There's 100 in the grade, you're ranked number 50. Um, mm-hmm. We've talked about this in other episodes, but just this week, Anika, I, I had a conversation with a very experienced college admissions counselor at a New England boarding school because a lot of my kids are at boarding schools that I work with. So we do joint counseling together. So we collaborate together on the school list and strategy and everything. So we're talking about this and we're talking mm-hmm. about a school that they want all A's, they want the kid at the top of the class, they want advanced classes, and they're not taking into consideration the fact that our kids already coming in the door are in the top 5% just to get into our school. And I do find mm-hmm. that a fair, fairly frequently where there is, I call it institutional ego on the part of schools where they just think, oh, I know we're so much harder than you, so we only want to take your top of your top of your top. Well, if you're dealing with the population that's already self-selected, um, you could maybe drop down and take a kid that's in the middle and that kid could do fine and in, in excel in your school. But schools don't like to think of that. They think, you know, no, we're like, we only go for the top of the top of the top. So it can really mm. hurt your placement because, you know, you're compared to your other peers and your other peers are already exceptionally strong. And then the other points you mm-hmm. mentioned is it can create this real culture that is divisive to school unity. It can create an unhealthy competitiveness. Um, There can also be Mm -hmm. something uh, called AP obsession, where people are obsessed with taking all these AP classes, because a lot of times in these uh, rankings, Anika, they're using weighted GPAs, which means you get more points for 
advanced classes, right? So people want to take AP so they can climb up the ranking uh, compared to their peers. And while it's good to take advanced classes, AP obsession is not healthy. It's not healthy at mm-hmm. all. And that's, that's mm-hmm. that mindset that I have to take every single AP, the more I take, the better, and not looking at, is there balance in your life? Are you taking, um, you know, are you excelling in other areas, socially, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, mm-hmm. and all these other areas, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so for those reasons, uh, I'm, I'm a huge advocate, um, in, especially in highly competitive schools. Now, the reason why I differentiate is if the school is not as competitive, then you don't have that problem where a, a fairly high achieving kid is going to end up with a low ranking. Because right. remember, high, high ranking is going to work to your favor. Like, like mm-hmm. I, I'm working with several kids this year that are in the top 10% of their class, and they would nowhere, there was no way in the world they would be in the top 10% of their class if they were at a different high school. And that top 10% of their class is really going to help them in the college admission process. So, mm-hmm. uh, it's, so I don't feel as strongly about it when you're not in the culture where parents and parents are driving kids and everyone's already a high achiever, which you tend to get in more upper middle class, upper class, affluent suburbs and private schools. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say the big because, you know, I'm always focused on the big takeaway. Right. So the big takeaway, I'm a parent at a school that ranks. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do I do? What what do I focus on? I'm a parent at a school that doesn't rank. What do I focus on? Great. You know what? How do you do it? it? What's your best 20 second response to both of those parents? Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're a parent at a school that ranks, then you need to be very mindful of the colleges that you're applying to. And are they going to what are the expectations they're going to have for where your ranking will be? Because quite a bit of emphasis will be put on ranking uh, if your school ranks and it's a school that does holistic admissions. Okay. So that's for that's for the school that ranks for the school that doesn't rank. Uh, just. Don't criticize this because sometimes schools like that get criticized. Like, why are we in ranking? I've, I've had this a lot where parents think their kids are at a disadvantage, that they don't get to have a, you know, eight out of 120 or whatever on their transcript and they feel like it's hurting them. Trust their administration. They're actually smart and they're actually doing it to not only control the culture of the school, but to actually help make it easier for you to get into schools. Hmm. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. Okay, Mark, our question this week comes from Mr. Edgar. He is a 12th grader in Miami. He's a 12th grade student. And he wants to know, Mr. Mark Stucker, who should he ask to write his, or which of his teachers should he ask to write his recommendations? First of all, I got to give a shout out to our students because we've been really having quite a few of them ask questions recently. Mm -hmm. And that really warms my heart. You know, Anika and I, uh, obviously, you can tell by the name of our podcast, Your College Bound Kid, that we fully expect parents to be podcast listeners. Uh, But students, bring it on. We love it. And it's nice to know that that some of you are are checking in. So we love to hear our students and even asking us questions. Um, Mm -hmm. this is a great question and it's a great question to ask now, uh, because now's the the time that a lot of people are making this decision, especially for seniors. Um, Anika, I'm going to give you a stab at this first, put you on the spot extemporaneously. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you if you were the college counselor and I asked Mm -hmm. you the question, who should I ask to select or who should I select for my teacher recommendations? I want to hear your answer and you. You know me, you know, I'm going to tell you if I think you got it right and, or what you got right or what you got wrong. You know, I'm going to come straight with you. Well, I'm going to go first with the teacher that knows you the best Good. and not only knows you the best, but knows your best qualities the best. Because I've always thought about this, Mark, even back in the day, 400 years ago when I was in school, I'm like, what is that mm-hmm. person really writing in that letter? Like, what are they mm-hmm. really saying? Because I don't know. So Mm -hmm. do you want to sacrifice or do you want to take that chance of just asking this random person that you just so happen to take a class with and, oh, she's just standing right there and, oh, can you write my recommendation? No, you don't want to do that. And 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 just that you want to you want the best relationship and the best the person that can speak to your best qualities, period. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we've done so much great work on this podcast, Mark, or excuse me, you've done so much great work. No, 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 no. You better you better correct the you and make it a we. I'm serious. Well, let me just focus on you for now, because you highlighted that great point a few episodes back and you're so good at quoting the numbers. But we talked about teachers who don't actually know how to write 
And I never mm-hmm. actually really thought of it. I mean, that was mm-hmm. an eye opener mm-hmm. for me because I just assumed mm-hmm. every teacher knows how to write a great recommendation recommendation letter. And that is not the case. Now, how mm-hmm. we find out how that teacher, if that teacher knows how to write, I want you to expand, you know, expound on that. Yep. Uh, but that's mm-hmm. something that we definitely have to consider. Absolutely. Bingo. So I wrote down here eight points um, to consider in selecting teacher recommendation. And you absolutely nailed three of them. Any anything else, or, or no? I just want to start with those. Those are my top three. <laughs> okay. okay, 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 great, great, great. So I'll add a couple more. But by, by the way, bingo, bingo, bingo. I agree on every right. one of your points. What I call a raving fan. So mm-hmm. someone who's going to be enthusiastic about you because it will come through whether or not your teacher believes in you. So you hit mm-hmm. that point. Someone if they know you outside of class, that's ideal. It's not, I would say, a requirement, but it's ideal. Because remember, in bigger schools, that's really hard to do sometimes. But this would be the ideal template of like the superstar recommendation would be knowing you outside of class. But I understand in sometimes larger schools, that's harder. But it definitely should be someone who knows you well, for sure. OK. Mm-hmm. And then good writers, good writers. Um, so let me just while I'm on the good writer, let me just answer your question on that. Um, the way to find out if someone's a good writer, one of the ways is to ask the school counselors that you work with, because a lot of times they'll know that. Mm. Um, certainly in smaller schools, and a lot of times even in bigger schools, they'll know that. If you're in a school, and this tends to be more private schools, where there's comments that get sent home, um, you can take a look at how they write in those comments. Mm. So for example, you've had that, at Nika, at the school, mm-hmm. both of your kids, where Janae mm-hmm. and Jalen went, you know, there's teacher comments, like take a look right. at their writing. Um, and but talk to your counselors about who the better writers are amongst the options you're considering. So those would be three points. Let me throw five more on the list. One is I strongly recommend you take a look at who taught you in the 11th grade. Now, why okay. do you think I would say that, Anika? Why would I highlight the 11th grade? I, I just have it in the back of my mind that that's the year that these colleges are focused on in terms of grades. Um, and I'm just going to stop there. Okay. So there's two reasons for it. One is it's not so far ago that they're not like, you know what? This kid has changed so much. What the ninth grade teacher says, like, how do I know I can trust it? That was three years ago. The kid could have changed a lot. So it's recent enough to be credible, Mm -hmm. right? That's one reason, which Mm -hmm. is kind of what you were saying. Colleges focus on the 11th grade, right? But the other reason is that you're taking more rigorous classes then Mm -hmm. as well. So the school gets to see how does a teacher write about you when you're in more rigorous classes? Okay. All right. So that's the reason. And the reason why you don't, why would I say not to do 12th? Because 12th is more recent than 11th. So why not just do 12th? Well, because you haven't completed 12th. So they can't take a, they can't, you know, give a really comprehensive view of how you performed. I guess. Yeah. You basically, nailed, you, no, you basically nailed it. So what I would say with 12th is this um, let's say you're applying to school with a January deadline, right? So you don't want to last minute your teacher because that's one way to tick them off. Yeah. So, you know, so you don't want to last. I mean, last minute. I mean, ask them at the last minute. So then if you're not going to be asking them, that means what are you going to ask them in October? Well, they don't really know you all enough. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. To to write about you. And if you wait much longer than that, now you're doing what everybody else does. You're coming in with the pack and now they're not going to be happy because they want to have a life, too. Okay, so Anika, so you mentioned the point about the, they should be excited about you. They should know you outside of the class, preferably. They should be good writers. Um, and I said preferably in the 11th grade, and we gave the reasons. Uh, a fifth thing is that you want to select teachers that taught you in more rigorous classes, right? So that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons for 11th, because they've been more rigorous. But even within 11th, and this is an ideal scenario. So why do you think it's preferable to select someone that taught you in an IB, an AP? an honors class versus a regular class? Well, obviously they can speak to the work ethic, right? Um, how, how well, well, ideally you did well in the class first, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. but that's that you were at your, you were at the height of your performance, um, ideally. So they should be able to speak to that. So, so the way I would put it is they can speak to your ability to process and excel in higher level work, mm-hmm. right? So it's not just the work ethic is can, because college is going to say, okay, especially a more selective college, you're going to say, you're going to be stepping your game up to come to us. So mm-hmm. if a teacher is writing about how you did in more complex or difficult classes, that means more to them, right? Th- when you think about admissions, Anika, think about it as risk, reward, risk, reward, risk, reward. So you're always looking at what is the risk for the student versus mm-hmm. the reward. Right. And so if you have shown, if the teachers can, can 
positively articulate your ability to excel in more advanced classes. It just gives them confidence on the other end that you can do well in advanced classes with them and you can handle the jump to their rigor. Yep. So the, the next thing uh, point would be preferably take students, uh, sorry, preferably select teachers that have taught you in math, science, English, history, or foreign language. And why do you think I would say that? Uh, AKA your core classes. Exactly. This, class? this is, yeah, yeah. This is the, this is the steak and potatoes. This is the meat and potatoes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, vegetarians. I had to get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's that when, when schools assess your curriculum, they're mostly looking at those classes as opposed to the art class or the dance class or the theater class, unless you're, of course, totally, 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 totally different if you're looking at majoring in those things, right? Or going to an mm -hmm. art school, but I'm talking about that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's, the, those are the, that's really where you should select from. And I'll tell you what would be most ideal would be um, one, one recommendation writer be math and, or science and another recommendation writer be English history, foreign language. It's kind of a left brain, right brain thing. Mm -hmm. And some mm -hmm. schools will even tell you, like an MIT will actually tell you that. We want one from math and science and we want another one from like, you know, English history, foreign language. Okay. So. That's another point is read the instructions very carefully because some schools will tell you what they want you to, you know, uh, what recommendations they want you to send. Right. Usually they give you, you know, a choices like normally it'll be like math or science. Okay. Um, so that's another thing. And another thing in reading the fine print is read how many you're able to submit because some schools literally are zero and some want one and some want two. Hmm. Right. And we talked about this in another episode recently. Some allow for more. There's what they require versus what they allow. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last couple of points that I, I would mention is that you want people that are going to be responsible and reliable. Hmm. Okay. So this is hard to know too, but you right. don't want that teacher that I've, I've, I've sent you reminders like every <laughs> third week. And I told you like in the end of my junior year uh. in June. And it now so it's um, October 20th and I'm up against the deadline and I'm stressing out because I don't want to be pestiferous, but I don't want to miss out on opportunity like you don't want that either. Right. So um, so reliable responsibility. And once again, sometimes that's a thing you can ask the counselor. You can say, yeah. what's I'm thinking about? It, I, just, I, I can't decide between Miss Davis and Mr. Jackson. Mm -hmm. What has been your experience with their ability to turn things in on time? Because mm -hmm. there's really it's going to be really difficult for you as a student to know that. Right. So, Mark, are there any is there any mm -hmm. when you when you think about a teacher's orientation when they start a job? Um, mm -hmm. Is there any emphasis on that at any point during that? you know, just getting acclimated to the job itself, just recognizing that that's a big thing. I mean, that's a big deal. It's not like that's, you know, something that just may or may not happen. No. You, know, uh, you know, these these recommendation requests are going to come every year. So are these schools making yeah. an effort to ingrain that in the teachers at some point or sometime or in some way? I would imagine. I would so, hope so. So it's a fantastic question. And the answer, like a lot of these answers are, it varies. It mm -hmm. depends. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, this is where you see advantages in college prep environments, right? So if you look at the schools where both your kids are at boarding schools, uh, they're they amazing at this. Like they mm -hmm. do recommendation writing training and workshops and the college counselors oftentimes oversee the recommendations before they're even submitted and will and will tell the teacher like, go back and fix this up because it's mm -hmm. not good enough. And, and the training, I mean, it's unbelievable some of the training that's provided in the college preparatory environments. Versus a, a student I met with on Saturday and I was talking with her about some of these things as well as some other things about scholarships. And I was saying, go to my school counselor. And she's like, they're clueless. There's <laughs> nothing. We don't have a college counseling page mm. on a website. We don't have anything. They literally just gave us a book and said, you're kind of on your own. Yikes. And I said, well, I guess I guess that's why you hired me. But <laughs> <laughs> but I really didn't know. <laughs> didn't know what to say. I mean, I knew what to say, but I, I you know, it's there's such wide divergence and variance from school to school in this area, Nika. It, mm. Ideally, I wish every school did it, mm -hmm. but, you know, not every, some schools are just trying to, you know, keep, keep the kid from going crazy in class and they're just <laughs> putting fires out and they're not even thinking on those levels. Right. So just, it, 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 it's all over the place. So that, that, that's, that's really, really it. Well, thanks, Edgar. Thank Edgar. And mm -hmm. yeah, Edgar, you keep rocking it down there in Miami. Okay. Uh, we right. love to see, and we'd love to hear from more of our students as well. That's right.
So listeners, we don't invite guests back unless they 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 crush it and they rock it. And that's what Deb did. And when we had her here in episode 18, I thought it was one of our best episodes and one of our best interviews. So we had her back um, and she's going to talk about Smith College. And you may be thinking, well, I got a guy. So why would I want to listen about a women's college? I really want to encourage you to listen because there are going to be young ladies and women in your life. And just what she says about women's colleges in general and Smith in particular is going to be worth it to listen. So listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. Listening family, if you heard episode 18, we were fortunate enough to have Deb Shaver be our guest on that episode where she talked about women's colleges, and I thought she was fantastic. So we've asked her to come back again, and this time to explicitly talk to us about Smith College. Welcome back to your College Bound Kid, Deb. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So Deb is the recently retired. So Deb, why don't you start by walking us through how you got into admissions and how you ended up at Smith? So I graduated from Cornell University, a very different institution than Smith. And I was a tour guide, which is not a good reason for getting into admission, but it worked for me. <laughs> uh, my, f- my first job was at a small technical uh, college in upstate New York, part of the SUNY system, State University of New York. And it was a one-year maternity replacement as an admission counselor. And I loved it. And that's been my profession ever since. From SUNY College of Technology, I went to Alfred University, which is a small regional university in upstate New York. Um, while I was there, I got my master's degree in counseling. But I knew I really wanted to work at a highly selective liberal arts college. And so from Alfred, I went to Colgate University, where I was for a number of years. My husband followed me to Colgate, so the next move was his. And so I followed him to Western Massachusetts. And that's when I started work at Holy Cross College. After Holy Cross, I took six years off when I had my son. And then I started at Smith, and that was 24 years ago. Wow, great for you. And one of the things, one of the things, you know, when when people have been at a few different institutions, they really get to figure out what they want, what they don't want, where they can passionately advocate for, where they can't. And and so I know after I guess that was what, five institutions, I think? Mm -hmm, Yeah. Yeah. So I know that you were very intentional in selecting Smith. So tell us a little bit about the the history of Smith. Well, let me first say that, you know, we talk to students who are in this college search process all the time about finding your fit or your match, right, in a college. Mm -hmm. And I feel when I landed at Smith that I found my professional match. And that's why I've stayed here this long. Um, So it's been sort of the right place for me. And and I'm proud of the work I've done at Smith, but I'm also deeply indebted to Smith for all the opportunities that the college gave me as well. So Smith's history. So Smith was founded in 1871. Through a bequest given to a woman by the name of Sophia Smith, hence Smith College. And she was single and she didn't have any children. And so she chose to use her inheritance to found a women's college. And the reason that she wanted to found a women's college was she felt that women needed to be educated in the same way as men's colleges at the time, specifically colleges like the Ivies, which were all male at the time. And One of the things that she, and I'll quote, I'll somewhat quote her. She said, it is my wish that the institution be so, be so conducted that during all coming time, it shall do the most good to the greatest number and be a perennial blessing to the country and the world. And I think that's what Smith has been. You know, I have to say, I'm also a little indebted to Smith. So nothing fires me up more than when one of my former students goes into admissions and I've had three students that I've worked with that have gone into admissions careers. One of them did her undergrad education at Smith, and one of them, Deb, was part of hiring in, in the admission <laughs> office So very recently. So I, I'm very grateful to Smith for training one and hiring another one. So, and we are lucky to have her. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, so Deb, let's, let's talk about some of the schools that you overlap with, right? So students look at Smith, and they also look at XYZ schools. I'm interested in both your mm-hmm. single gender overlaps and your co-ed overlaps. And this is uh, kind of a a part two, part one and part two question. Uh, I'm also curious as to when students select Smith over both those single gender overlaps and those co-ed overlaps, what are the reasons they tell you either through surveys or just anecdotally what you hear from them? 
So the schools that we overlap with the most, and it's pretty consistent year after year, would be Wellesley, Barnard, Brown, Wesleyan, and Vassar. And as you can imagine, Wellesley and Barnard, the women's college piece, right? This mm-hmm. interest in women's colleges. Brown, and to a certain extent, Wesleyan, um, of similar vibe, mm-hmm. and Brown also has what is called an open curriculum, mm-hmm. which Smith has as well. And Wesleyan has, I guess I would call it a modified open curriculum. Mm-hmm. And so I think students are attracted to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Vassar, I think, again, we have this of a similar vibe, but also a deep commitment to access mm-hmm. um, that I think Vassar also emulates. Yeah, so so that makes sense why people who are savvy and have done some research would be looking at you as well as those schools. So mm-hmm. so when students, let's say, get in all of them or get in multiple schools and they end up picking Smith, given that you have those things in common, what are the, some of the reasons they tell you, well, here's why we chose Smith? I think it's some of the ways in which we're distinctive or different than either these other colleges or um, liberal arts colleges in general. So, of course, one of our, our distinctive um, aspects would be the open curriculum, mm-hmm. uh, because there aren't very many colleges that have an open curriculum. It's Smith, Amherst, Brown, Grinnell, Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the open curriculum means that there aren't any core requirements or distribution requirements. So the student who is excited about um, the res- you know, having the responsibility and freedom and flexibility to sort of um, form her own intellectual path, mm-hmm. right? Now, there are major requirements once the student declares her major, but before that, there's an enormous amount of freedom and flexibility to explore the curriculum. And, and the open curriculum is distinctive in the fact that it changes the dynamic in the classroom. And by that, I mean every student in every classroom wants to be there. Right. She's not there to check off a box, you know, oh, I have to take two history courses or I have to take two fine arts courses or something like that. So the level of engagement in the classroom is very high because every student in every classroom wants to be there. So that would be one reason students choose it. Another is that we have a guaranteed paid internship for students. It's called the Praxis Program. It's a Greek word meaning practical education. And students can take this stipend. summer of sophomore or junior year and take this money funding anywhere in the world because we think it's important that students have that kind of practical experience and there are a lot of unpaid internships out there and we want to make sure that students can take advantage of them and students have done things like interned in Kew Gardens in London or Columbia Records in New York or the Smithsonian, the Dutch Parliament. We had a student recently who was a doula in a maternity hospital in Mexico. So students do all sorts of things with this and we know that well, internships don't necessarily mean lead to jobs. Internships lead to connections that lead to jobs. So the Praxis program is very attractive to students. Another is we have a house system. Students don't live in dorms. They live in houses. So this idea of community, you know, this this ready-made community, smaller community within the larger Smith community. We have 37 houses on campus. Within those houses, there are 16 dining rooms. So it's not just a place to live or sleep. It's a place to live. You know, students talk about it. The houses sometimes as being sort of their families. You walk in, people know your first name, your last name, where you're from, what you're studying, the kinds of things you're involved in. Um, And so students really love the house system and are very attracted to that as well. And I definitely can see how the open curriculum produces passion. I mean, I would have loved nothing more than this. I like, I love sociology. I love social psychology. I love history. I would love to study that. My dad was a chemistry teacher, but oh my goodness, don't give, don't put me anywhere near chemistry. (laughs) In high school, I hated French. So, you know, so I would have loved that. But sometimes I, when I, when I share uh, the open curriculum to families, I do hear them say, well, how do you ensure that people are balanced mm-hmm. or how do you ensure that you get the general skills that you need for jobs? So can you talk a little bit about sort of the academic advising system and how that yes. plays a role in course selection? So, you know, it's the open curriculum is not the Wild West, right? <laughs> we, we want students to be navigating the open curriculum in a really thoughtful and intentional way. And because of that, because of the open curriculum, advising 
becomes even more important, right? Mm -hmm. So at Smith, we don't have what are called pre-major advisors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just about deciding what your major is going to be. That's going to be that's going to come organically. You're going to figure that out in, in the first two years that you're in college. So liberal arts advising is about how do I make the most of this open curriculum? How do I figure out which courses complement other courses? But it goes beyond just academics. The faculty will talk. It's much more holistic. The faculty will talk to students about, okay, what about internships? Let's start talking about internships that would complement your academic interests. Let's talk about study abroad opportunities and how those would complement your academic interests. You know, let's talk about the kinds of things you're involved in outside the classroom that also could complement your academic interests. So it's much more whole, this a sense of advising, we call it liberal arts advising, is much more, more holistic. And in fact, every student, because of the open curriculum, is asked in one way or another over and over again, what does it mean to you to be liberally educated, hmm. right? And everyone, the thing about an open curriculum is everybody can have a different answer to it, right? It can be her own answer. Um, but students are asked to really think about that. So they intentionally use the open curriculum to their, you know, to their best of their ability and what's going to um, serve them the best. And frankly, you know, our institutional research department will say that, um, you know, almost 90% of the students, when we look back at what they have taken, um, would have fulfilled a core had we required it. But they do it on their own terms. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 33 is the New York Times bestselling book, The Naked Roommate. The subtitle of this book is, and 107 other issues you might run into in college. The book provides expert and student advice about roommates, relationships, classes, friends, finances, dorm life, sex, alcohol, Greek life, laundry, and so many other areas. Here are some of the chapters from the book, The Right Naked Roommate. Arriving on campus, residence halls, living, eating, bathing with hundreds of strangers, roommates, good ones, bad ones, and everything in between. Finding friends, your social or antisocial life. Getting involved on campus and all you can do buffet. Greek life, behind the doors, windows, and walls of fraternity and sorority life. The book is by Harlan Cohen, and I recommend you get the fifth edition. I bought it for my daughter Joy before she went off to college, and I recommend parents that you give the naked roommate to your child before he or she heads off to college. Now, Resume my interview with Deb Shaver about Smith College. Now, let's talk about stereotypes, stereotypes and misperceptions about Smith that, that you hear that you don't feel are accurate that, um, you know, you just like to uh, maybe comment on for our listeners. Mm -hmm. And this, I think I want to talk so maybe more broadly, even in terms of women's colleges, mm -hmm. because I do think that we talk about women's colleges by starting with the negative. Hmm. You know, you're not co-ed. No, we're not. There's a non-existent social life, which is not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the real world. You know, as if any college was the real world. Harvard's not the real world. Amherst isn't the real world. You know, Stanford's not the real world. We're all a bubble in some way. And Smith's bubble is at the fact that we're a women's college. Um, you know, that you're not the typical choice. As if, as if the, the non-typical choice is less than when I would say that it's more than, right? Mm -hmm. And my favorite is always, there's no male perspective um, in my request response is always, life is the male perspective. You can't avoid it, right? Um, and so I think that places like Smith are really challenging and they're empowering. Our students and alumni sp speak about empowerment all the time. And they are, in fact, fun, right? I think young women worry about this idea of fitting in and feeling comfortable at a women's college because they most young women haven't had that all girls, all female, all women's experience. And they don't know really how it's going to feel, right? But the fact of the matter is, you know, women's colleges, Smith is an example, are part of consortiums. And our consortium is the five college consortium. So it's Amherst, co-ed, Hampshire co-ed, Mount Holyoke, another women's college, and UMass Amherst, the flagship institution of the state of Massachusetts, you know, medium-sized public institution that's also co-ed. There are 25,000 students within 10 miles of each other. There's a free bus system. It leaves campus every um, 20 minutes, starts early in the morning, runs till three in the morning on the weekend. So it's not just for academics. And so there's there's a lot of um, interaction among the five colleges. 
five college students can take classes at Smith. Smith students can take classes at the five at any of the five colleges. The students can participate in co-curricular activities to the point where students at Smith can be in the UMass marching band because you know we don't have a football team. <laughs> um, so there, so this idea that you know you're separated from the the other half of the population um, is not true. It, they're men are there when you want them, and they're not there when you don't want them and the bathrooms are clean <laughs> you don't have a football team i learned something <laughs> just joking just joking so, so something else deb i've learned uh about smith uh i've learned this from talking with tara who's the admission counselor uh, who works mm -hmm. in the office is how strong your study abroad program is as well as how s the strength of the engineering program i knew they were strong but in talking with her i think maybe i've underestimated just how strong both of those are can you comment on both your study abroad options and and engineering, which you don't often see at a women's college. So about half of our students study abroad. And if you are a student who's on financial aid, you take your financial aid with you. So, uh, you know, for students, sometimes students who are on financial aid worry that they can't study abroad. Students at fin at, on financial aid at Smith can study abroad. We have four of our own programs, Florence, Geneva, Paris, and Hamburg. Um, and then we have some consortial programs where, where we're, um, we uh, partner with some other colleges. And then we partner with about another, I don't know, 100 or so colleges where you can go practically any place in the world. So this idea of studying abroad is really important to students and it's important to students at Smith. And, you know, even our science students are encouraged to study abroad, which is not always the case at liberal arts colleges, only because, you know, faculty are worried that, you know, what about your your um, your science courses that that you really have to have in order to graduate? Well, we feel it's important for everybody who wants to study abroad to study abroad. Which leads me to the engineering program. We at Smith have extraordinary strength across the curriculum. And as you can imagine, the humanities and social sciences have had a history of being deep and strong because women could were allowed to, could major in the humanities and social sciences. One of our pride points is the fact that 43% of Smith students major in math, science, and engineering. Nice. We are, yes, we we women are underrepresented in the sciences and engineering, and that's why we're so proud of the fact that so many of our students um, major in those areas. Engineering is a very big pride point for us because engineering, and it's an and it is an accredited engineering program. Very few liberal arts colleges have engineering, and we are one of only two, and we were the first women's college colleges to have engineering. That's excellent. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about what you look for in an applicant. Uh, what would make somebody shine and emerge from the applicant pool? Uh, we know you're highly selective. We know you're competitive. And then also we should let people know about you being a test optional school as well. But if you could um, just share some of the intangibles that make a, a young woman really attractive to you um, in, the, in the applicant pool, make them stand out. Well, I think that sometimes students and families um, don't quite understand that an admission decision is primarily an academic decision. I think um, when you, a lot of times when you read in the press about how students got into college, it's all about a hook, mm -hmm. right? But kids get into highly selective colleges like Smith because they're really mm -hmm. smart. And so, and done well you know, in school, the, the right? Smart and, they, and, they, yes, yes, and they've been able to exactly be productive right. and put it together because we know there's smart kids that are, are unable to turn their work in and that sort of thing. Yeah. True. True. And so, you know, at its most basic level, it's my job to put students in the classroom to keep the faculty happy. <laughs> um, and so that's why I talk about how it's it's primarily an academic decision. But, you know, at a lot of places like Smith that are highly selective, you have many more applicants who are competitive for admission than you have places mm -hmm. in the class. Right. And so we're looking for students who have deep interest academically in, in subjects, but also deep interest in something outside the classroom. Um, I want students who I want to see students who I think will become involved in this residential community. I don't care what students are sort of doing outside the classroom in high school, but I'm interested that they're doing mm -hmm. right and that they've they've um, found some things that occupy their hearts and their minds in a different way than in the classroom. And they've contributed time and energy over a period of time. Um, to those kinds of, of activities. And it doesn't have to be just in high school. I think sometimes students say, you know, 
well, I'm not on the soccer team. I'm not in student government. I'm not in the history club or the robotics club or that kind of thing. It could be you're involved in community service in your church or synagogue. It could be that you have a part-time job. It could be that you have to come home every day after school and babysit your younger siblings. All those things are important, right? But I am interested in students who want to be involved in, in community in some way. So does four hours of Netflix a day and four hours of Instagram a day count as doing something? That does not count as doing something. On the other hand, you know, it's okay to t it's okay to hang out. It's okay to hang out with your friends or do some things just for fun because I do think that this process is um, really stressful for students and they think they have to be doing something all the time. Um, so you have to find a balance is what I'd say. If there was a one quality that I'm looking for in a student, and sometimes it's, you know, hard to, to ascertain that as you're reading applications. But if I, if there was one quality that I would point to, that would be curiosity. Mm. Looking for students who are curious about academics, curious about sort of life outside the classroom, and just curious about life and, and each I'm other. I'm really glad you shared that because curiosity is not one of the first things that people think of uh, when they think of something that's valuable to, you know, to, to schools. But Schools are looking for people that love learning for the sake of learning, not just to get the grade, right? And so I think that's what you're, correct. What you're talking correct. about there. Well, Deb, let's wrap this up. This has been fantastic. Now, you have stayed at Smith for 24 years, and I know a lot of colleges would have loved to have you. So what's made you stay for a quarter, quarter of a century? And I know you recently retired, but I know you're still planning on staying actively involved in, in Smith, even in retirement. Mm-hmm. I think that Smith is the best way to deliver undergraduate education. Um, I, when I started at Smith, I totally drank the women's college Kool-Aid <laughs> um, and think it's such a wonderful opportunity for so many women. I think, you know, you don't come here because of admission officers like me or Tara, right? You come here to sit in the classroom with our mm -hmm. faculty or outside the classroom with our faculty. And the faculty is amazing. I think we have a lot of innovative programs. Um, it's a beautiful campus. But what I think has kept me at Smith, um, I was a first gen low income kid who landed at Cornell, um, not knowing sort of what this whole college thing was all about. And I am at Smith and I stay at Smith because it's deep commitment to mm. access to students. Mm. And by deep commitment to access, uh, what Deb's talking about is a very generous need based financial aid program. Is that is that I mean, I know it's even more than that because it's supporting students once they get there to Smith as well. But I'm sure that's part of what you're Correct. talking about, right? Is that fair, Deb? Yes, absolutely. It's that, and I think we have a reading and selection process that is very attentive to context, mm -hmm. where the students are coming from and how they're, you know, how they would be successful at Smith. Deb, I can't thank you enough and I wish you well. Enjoy retirement and uh, we'll be in touch. But I really appreciate you coming on for a second time on your College Bound Kid. Thank you. It was a wonderful opportunity. All right. Next week in the news, college applicants reflect on lessons learned. This is by one of our favorites, Mark, by Mr. Brennan Bernard, recently written in Forbes. And we and ooh, about to be a guest on our podcast up. in about a month. That's right. And we're going to be in chapter 34 of 171 Answers. And the chapter is entitled, What Hope Is There For Me If I Am Only a C Student? And Mark, you said this earlier, but I am so excited that these students are chiming in because guess what? We got another question next week from a student and this time they want to know. Yeah, I know they are rocking it. This time they want to know if there are any advantages to applying to college through early action or early decision. And finally, Mark, if you don't know, if our audiences don't know, I know you know, but the FAFSA application is coming back up. It opens on October 1st for the 2019-2020 academic year. And Mark has a most timely interview with Mr. Mike Runowitz, and he is the director of financial aid at Washington University in St. Louis. And they are talking about the common mistakes that families make on the FAFSA application. You better tune in. So, so listeners, I just have to throw something in there. Uh, don't you don't want to miss that interview with, with with Michael Runowitz. One thing he did that I thought was awesome. Um, and so he reached out to his entire staff, all the financial aid uh, counselors at WashU, and they all collectively pooled their knowledge wow. combined with mine as to what are the most frequent, most common problems and mistakes people wow. make completing the FAFSA. And that's what we're going to share with you. So you definitely want to listen to that so you don't make that mistake on that very important form. And also for our question, um, that's my second most question that I've gotten this week. Anika, I told you six people had asked me 
uh, why am I getting all this mail? Mm -hmm. I had four, four students ask me, what's the difference between early action and early decision? And what are the advantages to each one of them? Mm. So that student was one of the four and they were like right on point. Wow. Yeah. Um, hopefully they'll be tuning in next week. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you find this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send it to someone you know who could really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. Marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And your College Bound Kid is produced by Estevan Sartho. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you would like to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text at area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on each show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Dot com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.